Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our presentation about body images and eating relating disorders. My name is Brenda DeStefano. I am an occupational therapist here at Sathco River Center, focusing a lot on uh, children's mental health as well as sensory processing. And I'm Melanie Brown. I'm a clinical psychologist here at Sasco River Center, and I um, have a specialty in treating um, eating disorders in children and adolescents. So if you guys have any questions during the presentation, you feel free to throw them into the chat. We do have a time at the very end of our presentation to discuss a little bit more, but if there is something really urgent or pressing, you can always unmute yourself and ask us our questions. Um, with that kind of housekeeping under the way, we're going to go on with the show. All righty, so whenever we're ready, we're going to go on to our next slide. Perfect. So the beginning is we're going to talk about is kind of what is body image? Why is it important? Kind of how does it develop throughout our lifespan? foundations for it, and then also the connection between body image and eating disorders, as well as risk factors, and also ways to positively nurture your body image and how to prevent and treat some of these eating disorders and this relationship between the two, since there's a pretty prevalent um, connection between these two discussion topics going on. So the beginning we're going to even start with is what is body image? So body image is the um, positive or negative and is influenced by our internal and external factors, such as our personality, our social environment, and it can change throughout our lives. So what is it? It's the combination of our thoughts and feelings about our body. Now, when we say that, we can actually break it down into four different sections. Throughout our topic, we're going to be talking about body image as a whole, but think about these four different areas. So we have our perceptual body image, which is the way we can see our body. The thing about this is it's not always the most accurate representation about our body. A lot of times people may think their thighs are really big or maybe their body is really disorganized, but in reality, they're not that big or they're not that small. You could also have effective body image. That is the way you feel about your body. Now, this can be a combination of satisfaction and dissatisfaction. It could be dissatisfaction or satisfaction of the whole body or different parts. Maybe you really like your eyes, but really hate your ankles. So kind of looking at the different ways you feel about it. Cognitive body image is the way we think about our body and how we process it that way. So a lot of times this is where that preoccupation or pre yeah, preoccupation with your body shape and weight really come through. Um, sorry if I'm just admitting a couple of people into the group. And the last one we have is behavioral body image. These are the behaviors or the activities that we engage in as a result of our body image. This could be maybe we're going to show off a little bit more skin. Maybe we're going to cover ourselves a lot with a couple more layers. Maybe we don't want to go swimming, or maybe we want to work out in just a tank top and shorts. Different ways that our body image actually affects us and how we're interacting with our world. So those are the kind of four different areas of body image, but we're going to talk about body image as a whole. So going on. So. The whole point of this, why is body image important? Obviously, we know it really influences our lives. And there is actually a sense of both positive and negative having an impact on ourselves. So with a positive body image, feeling good about yourself, how you feel, how you're thinking about your own body, can help obviously with your self-esteem, your self-acceptance. A lot of positive, healthy life behaviors will result as it because maybe you're not restricting or you're not indulging in areas, you kind of have a little bit more of a healthy balance. Um, and also um, that balance with that food and physical activity. Um, you're more willing to maybe engage in certain activities outside, maybe going to the gym, going swimming, going biking. Also, you're going to eat things that are nutritious for your body, not just things that are low calorie or things that don't have a lot of fat in it. You're gonna have that balanced relationship. And also your sense of identity. Having body image is really important to help shape that optimal identity about ourselves. Now on the flip side, what if you don't necessarily have the most positive body image? Well, sometimes we have those unhealthy life behaviors may pop up or reduce physical activity. We don't feel comfortable engaging or working out because maybe we feel like we're unfit. People are going to judge us at the gym or we don't want to take off our clothes to go swimming. 
Um, sometimes you can create that negative relationship with food and eating. So maybe you're like, oh, I can't eat a whole sleeve of Oreos like we were talking about earlier because I'll feel so fat later. Kind of those type of perceptions. And a lot of times that leads to weight control behaviors. Kind of what am I restricting or what am I indulging in and excessively doing in order to kind of change my body image. And that kind of, like I said, it's that really optimal identity. So we talk about both because they do fluidly move throughout our lives, but how do we foster this positive one and why, what do we need for foundations of it? Moving on. So as we know, our body image changes throughout our lives. We could have one perception about ourselves even today. You could have a different one tomorrow. But kind of how does the skill and how does the identity of body image even create? So looking even back at our infants, we're a baby and we're nursing and we're engaging with our parents. That is where our initial sense of our body is starting to develop. It's also where interoception, which is the topic I'm going to discuss later, starts to form, which is actually really crucial part of building that foundation for body image. Later on, when you're infants and toddlers, I should say, we're kind of starting to recognize ourselves in the mirror or pictures. You're kind of understanding that, hey, I have a body. I'm not just a floating brain. And they're kind of be able to start seeing. I think if anybody has toddlers, you've seen them fascinated with a mirror or pointing to their friend. Be like, I recognize you. That kind of permanence is starting to form. And they're kind of able to kind of start thinking about themselves and how their body is. Um Usually I have like the preschoolers who are coming in. They have a little bit of understanding. Yes, they have a body. And now they start doing a little bit of comparisons with their body. Not necessarily always in a negative way. Could be like, I wish I was tall as you. Or Jimmy can run faster than I can. Kind of understanding that bodies are different. And they're kind of starting to form that. And keeping that nature and that positive. Yes, our bodies are different, but they're all important. Is really crucial for this age. Because once they start getting into school, now you're starting seeing some of those comparisons, but they may not always be positive. Unfortunately, there have been studies shown that negative body image can start in early childhood. So maybe they're like, oh, my body can't do the same thing they can, or my body's bigger than theirs, or I'm shorter. Starting to kind of show some of those feelings. Maybe they feel they're stronger. There can be positive body awareness at this age. But they're starting to understand more of that comparison and what it can and cannot do. Once you get to preteens and teenagers, puberty hits. And we all know that was a rough time. And we know that's really sensitive to how we feel about our body because it's changing, it's developing. We're like, what's going on? So this is a big flex in body image and how we feel about ourselves. It really can't change day to day. Maybe you got a zit now and it's the day before prom. Yeah, you're really not going to like your body sometimes but they kind of roll with those punches and kind of helping them guide through those motions. So even as adults, we're still feeling different ways about our body. Maybe we just had a child. Maybe we're going to a wedding. We want to slim down or build up some more muscles so we can lift our toddler who's growing so fast. Um, even new jobs, new people in our lives, new locations that can all impact our activities and our eating and our engagement and feelings about ourselves. So even from infants to probably when we're elderly, we're still thinking about our body and kind of having this different both positive and negative relationship with it. So we're gonna go on and talk about a little bit about the foundation of body awareness. I had mentioned that as infants, we are building this interoception skill. Now, as an OT, maybe this is just my area of um, niece that I'm obsessed with, but interoception is actually an eighth sensory system that we have in our body. There's three technically beyond the ones that we learned since we were probably toddlers, um, but it's really important for our daily living. Now, what is it? Interoception is the process of how the nervous system senses that are originating within our body. So this could be your heart beating really fast, maybe your breathing um, a little bit extra fast and you can feel your kind of body like heaving um, hot and cold the sensation of needing to go to the bathroom needing to have it thirsty your mouth is going to be dry 
Also, are you hungry? Can you feel those tummy rumbles or maybe like the butterflies in your stomach when you're nervous? Getting these different signals from our body are really important for the different parts. Now, why is this kind of linked to body awareness and eating disorders? So eating is intrinsically guided by this interoception system and the signals that are associated with it. It's considered a homeopath, homeostatic, psychosociological psycho need. So basically well-being and survival. Now, I don't want to scare anybody when I say this, but there have been part of the pathology for eating disorders includes a lack of this interoception. This does not mean that if you do not have interoception skills as a child, you are going to develop an eating disorder. No, we're not going to scare or say that. But it can be part of the pathology. So building a strong sense of this interoception system is going to put us on a good path and have us feel more secure about our body and this sense of eating and this relationship between it. So that's why it's really important for kids to kind of understand how their body is and what their body needs. Why is it giving it signals and how do we perceive those signals? We're kind of going to go on. That is the question is, how do you build that strong foundation for both body image and interoception? So for interoception, it's really gonna be involved of tuning into those body signals. So a lot of people who do yoga and they mindfulness, you know they talk you about watching how you're breathing, feeling different sensations in your body, um, breathing exercises themselves because you're expanding and contracting in your body. You're changing some motions. Focusing just on that movement kind of in tunes you to what signals you're going to get from internally in your body. Other ways to kind of help kids understand the different activities is doing alerting activities and heavy work activities. So what I mean by that is, okay, we're going to run in place like 10 seconds really, really fast. How are you going to feel after or some of us, when we walk up the stairs, we can feel our breath a little bit coming faster. Sometimes our heart is beating. We're like, are we out of shape? What's going on? Um, but just tuning into that signal and ask kids, like, do you feel your heart beating really fast right now? And they're like, yeah, it's like a marathon. Um, just a positive association with that. And also heavy work activities. Heavy work is any time that you're engaging your muscles, pushing or pulling or using the strength of your arms, the strength of your legs, even your core. It's making your body tune into itself more as a result of it because it links to the OT side, some proprioceptive skills that are inter in intersected with our interoception. And also modeling. Talk about your own body. Talk about how it's feeling. Like, oh, my tummy's growling. I think I'm hungry. Or, oh, my mouth is really dry. I think I need some water or, oh, I just went up those stairs and now my heart's beating really fast. And you kind of start modeling it for these kids and understanding that it's okay to feel these feelings and feel these different sensations and what it means to have that sensation. So next slide. How to build that body image. I just mentioned about modeling. Also model about yourself. It doesn't always have to be, oh, my legs are really skinny or arms. Try to avoid feeling that comparison piece. Talk about what your body can do. Like, oh, did you see my body was able to lift you up and spin you around like a tornado? Like the little kids giggling, laughing. It's like, look how strong my body was. Um, talk about body diversity because we know. And so many people in society all have different bodies and they have different perceptions about themselves. Maybe some are tall, some are short, some are skinny, some are a little, little bit thicker bone or not. Being able to express that and being okay with everybody's body looks different, but they're functioning and they're cool and kind of fostering that for children. Because I know children are pretty perceptive of that. I've had so many kids in the clinic being like, they look so different than me. And I'm like, yeah, but that's okay, right? Look how strong they are. Look what they can do. Um, fostering that diversity. And as we know, media, which Melanie will talk about later, can really um, influence our perspective on our own bodies. So as oh, bodies are cool, yeah, I'm going to talk about that book, actually. So I love that you're on top of it, Denise. That is a perfect book for that example. Um, but managing what 
influence that your children are taking in. Obviously, if they're young children, making sure that the media, the videos or something that they're watching are geared toward children. Because as we know, sometimes with more uh, teenage or adult content, they're going to focus, especially January. My goodness, how many um, commercials did you guys see for like Noom? for body weight, for Zempic, for fitness, for the gym. So many me messages came in that you need to get your body fit now is not where it is. We don't want kids to feel that way. We want them to think January means we have to go back to school after break. And that's all we want them to worry about. So I'm kind of managing where their media presence is. Next slide. I mentioned some examples of just modeling for your body is I love that my I love this one it says I love how my body lets me read cuddle and sing with you just fostering such a positive relationship between you and your child as well as letting their bodies be themselves or wow look at my body healing that cut I had or maybe they hurt their leg and we're always like oh you'll get better before you're married it's like look how fast your body healed itself or you jump so far, we're all different. And that's great. Kind of just fostering this. And this is really geared to the, those young children. Fostering this acceptance of my body is doing things, yes, but it's a good thing. And my body may not look like mom or dad's or maybe my cousin Billy, but that's okay. And that's really the starting that foundation for that body image skills. Next slide, we'll have some resources. So as Denise mentioned, that Bodies Are Cool is a great book that is geared for children, for younger children, kind of learning about that body diversity. There's also two other books called Her Body Can't or His Body Can't, depending on your child. And it kind of helps them explain about their bodies. And I think I know the His Body Can talks about like boys can cry or boys can enjoy uh, leaping or maybe being a little bit like not all muscles and the her body talks about really that strength and that ability to do things with it. These are all kind of geared for that younger uh, population, but it's really great to build that foundation. So that's those books. And we're gonna turn it over to the next slide. I believe Melanie is gonna talk about her children and teens. Yes, thank you so much, Brenda. That was such a great introduction to body image. And I'm going to move on to talking about how body image develops in ch older children and teens. So as Brenda, Brenda mentioned, um, body image is about how you think and feel about your body and it's really subjective. It's not how you actually look. Um, and it's a complex construct um, comprising thoughts, feelings and evaluations and behaviors. Um, so as an example, you can see this girl has some pretty positive thoughts about her body, that her body is strong and that helps her feel really good about her body and herself. Um, and it gives an example of how body image is, is a core com component to identity and self-esteem. And um, it comes from factors that are unique to this girl, um, like her personality, as well as external factors in her environment, like her family, her school, her friends, her culture, and um, media. And those all are contributors. So, and, and also, as Brenna mentioned, positive body imagery is associated with um, higher self-esteem esteem, and greater self-acceptance. Um, so unfortunately, body, negative body image develops in some children and teens as they grow. And um, it, it, it's really related to negative thoughts and feelings about their bodies. Um, and it comes from both internal and external influences. And it's important because it is a big risk factor for developing unhealthy eating and weight control behaviors and even full syndrome eating disorders. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the risk factors for body dissatisfaction that can lead to unhealthy eating um, and weight behaviors? Um, some of them are individual factors like age. Usually um, body dissatisfaction uh, develops in late childhood and early adolescence, but people of all ages can really have negative body image. Um, gender is also a risk factor. Females are more at risk, but it's important to know that males are also um, can have negative body image as well. Um, gender dysphoria um, is a risk factor. People questioning their gender struggle more, and that's beyond um, sex characteristics. Um, weight, um, higher weight individuals are at greater risk, 
And personality traits also put kids at risk, um, such as perfectionism, high achieving kids, and internal and those who internalize um, a thin body ideal and comparison to self. I think we lost our slides for a minute, but hopefully they'll come back. Um, thank you. So depression, anxiety, and low self-esteem are also risk factors for body dissatisfaction. And then importantly, um, as well, is, is to realize that probably not surprisingly, family and tier, peers who diet and express body image concerns really put kids for uh, at risk for developing um, negative body image. Um, if people around the child are dieting and, and restricting their food intake and talking about that, it puts them at risk. Social media comparisons and teasing and bullying about appearance and weight also are big risk factors for developing neg uh, negative body image. Next slide, please. So social media, I wanted to give a special call out to social media because um, it can be particularly harmful um, in developing negative body image and eating disorders in children and teens. Um, as, as everyone probably knows that the images are filtered and edited for unrealistic appearance and kids make a lot of comparisons to themselves um, of these unrealistic images to themselves, and it's very can be very damaging to self-esteem and body concept and the and the larger idea of their identity. Um, there's really unhelpful, unhealthy advice about dieting and exercise, uh, very extreme, and there are even pro-anorexia posts. Um, and once a kid starts looking in their at their feet, even if they just look up, I've seen this happen with my clients and clients. They'll just kind of on TikTok, look about, oh, how do I get thin? And then their whole feed bl blows up in really harmful um, uh, information about eating, dieting, and being low weight. Next slide, please. So how can you nurture positive body image in your child? Um, the first thing you can do is focus on the positive qualities of your child beyond their appearance. Um, be, uh, encourage your child, you know, point Point out the times that they're kind to another child or really courageously participate in a new activity or sport um, or that they worked hard on a project at school or something like that. But don't focus on um, appearance. Um, as Brenna mentioned, promote acceptance of different types of bodies as healthy. Um, don't just point out thin bodies and say that they look healthy or they look fit. Um, Focus on your the function of your child's body, not just their weight and shape. Brenna had some beautiful examples of that. Um, and also model healthy body image and acceptance yourself. So try to, even if you don't feel it, please try to say to your children, you know, that you have acceptance for your body and not talk about dieting or wanting to be thinner um, because that's really a trap and kids really pick up on that a lot. Um, and limit social media um, for the reasons that I just mentioned. As, uh, try as much as you can to limit social media. Next slide, please. Okay, great. Um, so don't make comparisons to others' bodies. Don't compare your child's body to other children's bodies or even things that you see in the media. Um, don't compare your own body to other adults. Um, don't talk about weight loss or dissatisfaction with your body or dieting. Um, don't use a lot of, a lot of people fall into this trap as well. Don't use Use the term healthy as a proxy for a thin body or restrictive eating habits. Um, don't connect sh eating sugar and treats to being bad because that just sets up kids for craving and for binge eating and wanting those foods and becoming obsessed with those foods if you restrict them. Um, and make exercise about weight. Don't make exercise about weight loss and shape. Make it up about doing fun things with other kids or being joyful and being outside. Don't encourage kids to just exercise to make their body thinner or uh, fitter. Next slide, please. Okay, so why is this, why is fostering positive body image, why does it matter? Um, it's a good predictor for psychological and physical long-term health. It prevents development of eating disorders if your child has pod positive body image. And there are three eating disorders that are very dangerous and harmful that have um, negative body image as its underlying pathology. So if you, David, if you could please collect three times, we'll see the eating disorders that have, one more time. Okay, so those eating disorders all have negative body image as their core, as their core pathology. So it's important to foster positive body image 
to um, be protect your children from developing these harmful um, disorders. Next slide, please. Okay, so I thought we could do something a little fun, hopefully, is um, because um, there are many misconceptions about eating disorders, I thought we could do a, a game where we play separate fact from fiction about eating disorders. Um, if you'd like to respond in the chat, um, I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. Let me see if I can get the chat up. There we go. Um, so the first question is, um, you could respond fact or fiction. Your child needs to be very underweight to have an eating disorder. What do you guys think? Is this a fact or is it a fiction? If you want to respond. Okay, I have some fiction. And David, you could go ahead and give us the answer. Okay, correct. That is fiction. Let's look at the next slide to see what the actual facts are. So extreme dieting, weight loss, strict rules about eating, obsessive, fo obsessive focus on eating weight and exercise, binge eating and purging all indicate an eating disorder. Even if your child is a normal weight, um, your child can be appearing to grow and be normal weight and be average or even overweight and still have a very serious eating disorder that, um, that warrants treatment. Okay, next next question, please. Okay, next question. Fact versus fact or fiction? Only girls have eating disorders. What do you guys think? Respond in the chat or respond in your head. Okay, David, you can give us the answer. So that's a fiction. Probably most people knew that. Go ahead to the next slide. So people of all genders, all ethnic backgrounds, all socioeconomic status, they all struggle with eating disorders. It's not just girls. Um, in fact, 25% of, uh, um, of those with eating disorders are thought to be male, that's an estimate. And um, it's important to note because people who, this it leads to under identification and under treatment of people who are really struggling with um, eating disorders. If if we kind of use those biased ideas about eating disorder, and and it's really important to know that um, youth with non-conforming genders and sexuality may be the very most at risk. Um, that's the latest research coming out. Is there are, you know really high rates of eating disorders in that group? Okay, my child eats healthy, so he or she does not have an eating disorder. What do you guys think? Okay, I'm seeing lots of lots of fiction out there. So let's have the answer. Yes, indeed, that is a fiction. Um, go on to our facts. So um, restrictive diets. So for example, only eating fruits and vegetables and lean protein, um, avoidance of carbs, fat, gluten, dairy, um, all sugar. These are overly restrictive for te uh, children and teens. Children really need high calorie diets in order to grow. Um, so it's really important not to restrict these foods or, you know, some adults are on these types of diets, but for children, they, they're really unhealthy. Um, so, and strict adherence to rules about eating um, may indicate an eating disorder or a developing one. Let's go on to the next question. Eating disorder attitudes and behaviors are common in teens. What do you guys think? I got some facts. A lot of people are voting for fact. Yes. Yes, indeed, this is a fact. So go on, let's let's look at more information. So eating disorder attitudes and behaviors are actually very common, in, especially in teens. A lot of teens worry about being fat. They, they restrict their food intake. They binge eat. They purge. There's an estimate in, in uh, a large scale study that 10% of both boys and girls engage in, in who are teens engage in some um, binge eating and purging. So it's pretty common and it may warrant treatment even if your child doesn't have a full syndrome eating disorder. Next question. Okay. Eating disorders are serious problems medically and psychologically. What do you guys think? Fact. Got some facts out there. Facts. Fact, fact, you guys are on this. All right, so let's let's have the answer. Yes, indeed, that is a fact. Let's look at them. Okay, eating disorders are indeed very serious and associated with life-threatening medical complications, depression, anxiety, and OCD. And anorexia nervosa is um, the most uh, dangerous and it has really it has the highest rate of mortality for any psychiatric illness. So I don't want to scare you all, but if you see signs of this in your children, it's really important to get 
um, help with it as soon as possible. Okay, let's go on to the next, next question. Um, eating disorders are primarily caused by a toxic environment like social media. What do we think? Fiction, we got some fictions. You got a fact. Okay, let's see the answer. This is a harder one. Um, it's a fiction, believe it or not. Environmental influences are important, but eating disorders are highly heritable. Um, there are many uh, high level of genetic and biological factors. There's about the heritability is about 50% more for most eating disorders. So environmental influence are important, but they're not the sole cause. So it's not, um, you know, the parent's fault or the environment's fault when a child necessarily has an, has an eating disorder, but we can use environmental influences to, and try to prevent the harmful ones to protect our children from eating disorders. So let's go on to the next one. Okay. So, um, what are the environmental risk factors? They're flying up there like crazy. So there are individual risk factors, uh, uh, environmental risk factors like body dissatisfaction, um, weight concerns, internalization of the thin body ideal, unhealthy eating and weight control behaviors, being overweight, depression, anxiety, perfectionism. Those are all um, factors that the child may have learned in their environment that are individual to the child. But there's also other influences like social media and media in general, because it promotes unrealistic beauty standards and body standards um, and overly restrictive compulsive eating. Um, family and peers are a huge influence. Um, as I mentioned before, there's social pressure, teasing, all those things can increase risk for eating disorders. Toxic food environments, um, fad diets, beliefs about food, like carbs are bad, I hear that all the time. Um, carbs are not bad for children, they're good for children, children need them for energy. Um, and stressful life events like COVID, which I'll talk about in a second, um, can lead to unhealthy coping. Some kids use um, restricting their eating or under eating, uh, under eating or overeating as ways to kind of cope and control their, their environment when they're a lot of, they're under stress. So next slide, please. So COVID, I just want to talk a little bit about COVID because um, rates of eating disordered and eating disorders and eating disordered behavior surged during the pandemic. Um, and it was considered a, a secondary pandemic to the eating disorder pandemic, secondary to the COVID pandemic. Um, children are were a particularly vulnerable population and it's still, the effects of it are still um, being seen. The number of new eating disorder cases and increases in hospitalizations doubled, uh, for example, at Boston's, Boston, Children's Hospital, Boston Children's Hospital. Um, the increased anxiety from lockdown increased vulnerability. Um, as, so, as I said before, some kids, the, you know, the young man on the, on the right, he, he looks like he was overeating and binge eating, whereas the, the young girl on the left, um, she's uh, engaging in, in compulsive exercise and worrying a lot about what she's eating and exercising. So those were two on both ends of the spectrum, we saw huge surge surges in, in problems with eating and weight in children. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm just going to give you briefly um, some information about the eating disorders that parents should be aware of if you're not already. Um, anorexia nervosa, the, the signs of that are weight loss resulting in low body weight. Or with children, it's really important to know, and even some pediatricians miss this, that failure to make your the child's expected growth targets on their growth trajectory, um, if, if your child's failing to kind of go up as much as they should in weight, um, each year, that is the equivalent of losing weight for an adult. So that's a sign of an eating disorder if your child falls off their growth trajectory. Um, there's an intense fear of gaining weight or being fat, and there's um, too much concern with weight and shape and denial of the seriousness of the problems. Um, two sub, okay, we'll go on to, I'm not gonna get into too much detail. Okay, let me let me just say a few more facts about anorexia. It onset the onset is usually um, between eight, um, eleven, and eighteen years. Although the incidence in children under twelve years is really skyrocketing, unfortunately, um, there are high rates of mortality and medical complications with anorexia. 
hypoxia um, and dangerous medical complications due to the state of starvation. So there's loss of brain volume, there's heart abnormalities, um, loss of menstruation and long-term infertility, um, bone loss, osteoporosis, growth impact, high rates of depression, anxiety, OCD. Um, so the takeaway is this is a very dangerous disorder um, with long-term consequences. So seek help for your child as soon as possible if you see the signs of this. Um, next slide, please. So bulimia nervosa, this is episodes of binge eating um, with compensatory behaviors, um, inappropriate compensatory behaviors like um, self-induced vomiting, um, excessive exercise or um, laxative or diuretic um, misuse. Um, and for the, the, the differentiator between bulimia and um, anorexia is weight. So people with bulimia have, have uh, normal weight. Okay. Um, this like anorexia, um, this, uh, there's high rates of, uh, mortality and medical complications. Bulimia usually starts with dieting, restricting food intake, which then leads to binge eating and purging. Um, and it's associated with emotional dysregulation, depression, and impulsivity. Okay, go on. Could we go on to the next one? Okay, binge eating disorder is like bulimia, but there is no inappropriate compensatory behaviors. Um, so it, it consists of, of frequent binge eating and it's extremely depressing. And this presents more commonly um, than the other disorders in males. Um, so it, it's really important to get help for your child if you, if you uh, notice that they're um, starting to engage in binge eating. It's usually uh, kids with higher weight, uh, people with higher weight and precipitated by dieting like uh, bulimia. One more eating disorder I just wanted to touch upon. The next slide, please. Is ARFID, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. This usually presents with younger kids. And I know Brenna and her, her OT group um, helps with kids with this type of eating disorder quite a bit. Um, it's, it's basically extreme picky eating and failure to make appropriate, uh, to be able to get in enough of nutrition. Um, or, and it also can, you know, have a lot of interference with the kids functioning, like not being able to eat lunch at school, not be able to go to a friend's house. Um, so the difference between this eating disorder and the others is there's no weight or body image concerns. It's really a kid. It's, it's often a child that has sensory sensitivity, which is why the OTs often work with kids with ARFED, um, cause that's their power alley and, or one of their power, power alleys. Um, so kids with sensitivity to taste or texture of food um, will develop this type of picky eating and, and you can get, it usually presents when they're very young and you can get some help with that um, through our T OTs and also our psychologists. Okay, so next slide, please. Eating disorder warning signs. Um, so this is what parents should be aware of. Um, and if, if they start to see these kinds of behaviors um, in their children, um, weight loss and failure to grow is expected, preoccupation and concerns about their body. The child might be talking about it a lot, thinking about it a lot, um, weighing themselves, worrying about the number on the scale, um, avoiding types of foods, carbs, sugar, gluten, um, counting calories, limiting portions, um, excessive focus on eating healthy. Again, I don't like, that's, that's one of my pet peeves is when people start talk about eating healthy and they're restricting all their food intake, it's actually really unhealthy and leads to a life-threatening eating disorder. Um, if, if your child start or teen starts isolating and avoiding eating with others, that's a sign. Um, Over-exercise and compulsive exercise is a form of purging um, and a, a symptom of, of bulimia nervosa. So that's important to recognize. Um, vomiting, if you're, if you're noticing vomit in the toilet, um, residue, that might be a sign that your child is engaging in these types of behaviors. Um, use of over-the-counter medications like laxatives and diuretics. And if there's failure to start menstruating um, in uh, puberty or um, loss of menstruation, that is a big warning sign um, of anorexia nervosa and even bulimia nervosa. 
Okay, next slide, please. So what can you do? Let's talk positively about, about what parents can do to prevent eating disorders from happening. Um, Brenna gave lots of excellent examples of this. Um, parents modeling healthy, healthy, she talked about examples of modeling healthy body image. Parents can do that as well as model healthy eating behaviors. Um, they can, and uh, so that's, being non-restrictive in your eating, eating all types of food, not limiting um, carbs or fat or whatever, you know, having a balanced diet, um, encouraging, encouraging positive eating. That's the idea of that all food is, is good food in moderation. And as I mentioned before, focus on joyful phys physical activity, not working out just for the purpose of influencing weight and shape. Next slide. Okay, so so family meals, um, creating a positive um, eating environment in the home is really important. That means having, you know, typically healthy foods like lean proteins and and uh, vegetables and fruits, as well as having some snacks and treats in the house and eating those in moderation. Um, and family meals are a huge protective factor um, for. Um, for in, for eating disorders, um, it, they are the in research. It's been found that positive outcomes. There's better dietary intake if you have fam regular family meals. Um, there's higher levels of psychological well-being. Um, there's greater academic success. These are all all predicted by having family meals together. Um, and there's lower substance use from having family meals. So a lot of benefit, robust protective factors for family meals. So if you can kind of fit in a dinner every night or something like that with your family, that would be really helpful to your children in multiple ways. Okay, next slide. Um, but so other ways to prevent eating disorders is focus on behaviors and overall health instead of weight. Um, zero tolerance for weight and body teasing in the home um, and enhance uh, media, media literacy skills. So please you know, help your children differentiate um, what's healthy body versus a doctored up image on uh, TikTok. Next slide, please. Okay, so last but not least, create a supportive environment with talking and listening about weight concerns with your children. Listen and provide support when the, your child brings up weight concerns. Keep communication open. When the child talks about being feeling fat or being fat, um, explore that more in a supportive, non-judgmental way, and um, show unconditional love, not not um, uh, not based on appearance or weight. So, next slide. So, what can you do if your child, if you're concerned that your child may may have an eating disorder? Um, as soon as possible, contact your child's pediatrician, psychologist, psychiatrist, or other mental health provider. Um, seek appropriate treatment. Um, an evaluation, medical evaluation, as well as psychological evaluation is necessary if you suspect your child might have an eating disorder. And then um, seek out evidence-based treatment, meaning what does evidence-based mean? It means that people have done lots of research and shown that it's a treatment that works. Um, a psychological treatment, uh, uh, medical treatment, that's what evidence-based means, that there's research, robust research to say that the treatment works. So um, family-based therapy is one of those treatments for eating disorders. Um, and um, that is the kind of gold standard for eating disorder treatment in children and adolescents. Next slide, please. Okay, so here are some resources, some books that um, if you want to access these resources um, after the presentation, you can find the recording online and, and uh, find these as well as Brenna's. Next slide, please. Here are some online resources for families um, for pre preventing eating disorders as well as seeking treatment. And next slide, please. Here are some additional treatment resources. We have outpatient um, family-based therapy as well as OT for feeding here at Sasco River Center. Um, here are some other centers that um, if your child needs higher level of care um, that we recommend. Okay, next. So thank you. We have a little question and answer time for anybody. If you'd like to 
um, bring up any questions in the chat or um, to unmute yourself and ask questions, Brenna and I would love to um, talk a little more. Hi. Hi. Hi, Elise. Um, thank you, both of you, uh, for this presentation. I do have a question um, about my child, um, but I'm not sure if it's appropriate to ask <clears throat> in this forum. Um, should I just give you a nutshell? Or are people, what is it appropriate? Talking? What, it, up to you. you. You could also kind of follow up and, and contact us, but if you feel comfortable to, to ask in this forum, ask the question, please feel free to. Okay. Um, I mean, both of you did address this. It's The question is around um, discussing with the child um, her concerns about her body image and her physical size. She's comparing, she's nine and she's comparing her body to her peers' bodies and um, she's negatively characterizing her own body. And um, I don't know if family therapy, um, when you mentioned that just now, I thought maybe yeah, that- yeah. That I think you're talking uh, for for family based therapy is for children with full syndrome eating disorders like the one oh. that I mentioned. But you okay. know, you as a parent could you know intervene there and in helping her kind of uh, normalizing her body and helping. There are some books that Brenna mentioned that maybe you could read with her um, that help. Um, with acceptance of one's body and, um, you know, developing more positive um, feelings about one's body. But if you feel like it's something that, you know, is persisting, you, you know, your child could benefit from some individual therapy that's not necessarily family-based for a full syndrome eating disorder to help her with her self-esteem and identity and, you know, some of those concerns she's having about herself and her body. Okay. And also, um, in terms of what might be a realistic a realistic time frame for a child of that age, I mean, we don't talk to her about weight loss and she doesn't talk about weight loss, but she is uncomfortable with her physicality in some way. I'm just wondering um, if that's something, I don't know, maybe that's more of a pediatrician kind of question, but expectations just for us as parents in terms of what might be realistic um, for her, for, for some weight loss, not to put her on a plan of any kind, but just, um, she is physically uncomfortable. So it's something, is that something that we should even be thinking about or just more focused? I, I think you I think probably your pediatrician is probably the first step, um, okay. to really understand if your child is a normal weight or if your child is overweight or obese and warrant some kind of change in her eating habits versus your child, this is kind of your, your child is in the normal range of weight um, and that she's uh, getting negative kind of um, information or thoughts or feelings about her body that are unrelated to being a normal, you know, a normal weight that aren't, don't match up with being a normal weight. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for asking those questions. Okay, looks like we have some additional questions. Brenna, do you want to look? Do you want to take those? Uh, I can have definitely answer. So we have two from Denise. One that's talking about um, restricting gluten or kind of sugars to help with certain behaviors. I know, um, like ADHD like behaviors. I know uh, the clinic switched our gummies recently because there was a whole one of our uh, therapists was on red dye forty um, impact on um, ADHD. So sometimes they're asking about how do they kind of avoid these kind of areas, but not getting to the dicey that we're avoiding it because it's not nutritious. And that can kind of be that good kind of body. Be like the way I, I would frame it to a kid when we changed our gummies and they all got really mad at me. <laughs> I don't have the um, big gummies anymore. I talked about this kind of new item we're doing or, oh, we're kind of choosing this other item. It's, it's going to make our body kind of feel 
in a better way and kind of be more nutritious for our body. Sometimes we reduce it. It's like, oh, our body, one of my kids used to say it, their body gets really grumpy when they have gluten. So it's like, your body doesn't get as comfy with this. So we're going to make sure it's happy and nutritious and kind of push it a little bit to a positive reason that we're changing away from that. Basically focusing on it's for your body to feel better. Um, and then the other one, one, I think, Melanie, this regarding your study about the genetic her her heredity yeah. of um, stats. Um, I'm kind of okay. curious, is there a gene marker? There, um, there is not a specific gene marker. There's, um, there's been a lot of research in genetics, um, and like many disorders, we've never found a specific gene. It's for any psychological or psychiatric disorder. Um, so the how do they get to the fifty percent um, hereditary um, figure for eating disorders? Is they do twin studies where you have to you use you compare kind of identical twin pairs to um, non-identical twin pairs. And you can come up with um, with uh, statistics uh, such as how much if this disorder is hereditary. Um, I wanted to add a little bit more about what Brenna said about restricting gluten and sugar. Um, unless your child has celiac disease, which absolutely should restrict gluten, there's really no reason to restrict gluten. Um, in your children whatsoever. Um, and sugar, sugar is not bad. There's no research that shows definitively that sugar as an, uh, as an ingredient is bad, although there's a lot of beliefs and um, stuff going on there about that. So everything in moderation is the way that I think about sugar. Um, so that's just my two cents about gluten and sugar. Yeah. And even something, Melanie, I wanted to mention that people had talked about when you were talking about modeling with positive behaviors. I know um, for some people right now, it is the season of Lent and you're taught to give something up. And now think about how many people give up food and they're like, oh, this will kickstart my healthy habit. And only recently I had to myself kind of switch it and be like, OK, this is not a time to restrict and lose these items it's time for a positive change so it's like oh I'm going to try to eat more veggies because I don't eat enough of my vegetables to get my nutritious benefits and kind of switching it that way even as you're talking about these simple things that some of us grow up for childhood and it still sticks to us to this day um but thinking about that part and then I'm gonna see there's another message also uh some of the research that studies that we used I think there might be some from Melanie's as well as some of the interoception links to the pathology of eating disorders will be in our reference list. Um, this included with the PowerPoints are a couple of good research articles that we are pulling from. Um, it seems like the next question we had is, what is the best way to get through to an 18 year old who's away at college, who's terrified of gaining weight and is restricting calorie intake and excessive exercising? Why do teens with ADHD have a higher risk for ED? And um, we did family meals, never restricted our treats, but talked about all the food moderation. Never really talked about diet or weight loss, but their child seems to be really worried about um, gaining weight in that restrictive eating. Um, so do you want me to take this one, Brenna? So sure. I might not Melanie. be, there's a lot there that um, mm -hmm. it's a lot of questions. Um, it sounds like a worried parent and, um, you know, maybe we can have a further conversation about this, but um, I, the best way to get through if you have an 18 year old at college that you're worried about these kinds of behaviors and maybe worried about them having an eating disorder, I would have your child professionally evaluated um, by a qualified eating disorder specialist, either at college or uh, at home and have their weight checked because um and their, uh, you know, the medical status checked as well, because there is a, a large uh, medical um, aspect to eating disorders that I would, I would say you kind of should have the evaluation um, either at school or at home with your child if you're worried about that. And I, I, I won't get into the, it's an interesting question about ADHD and higher risk for eating disorders. Um, I, I kind of beyond the scope of what we're talking about here today, but I might have that in the next webinar, talk about the next webinar that we do. So I hope that was helpful. And I agree, Melanie, like you said, about kind of checking in regarding um, possibly being evaluated at that age. 
Uh, we all have heard of the freshman 15 and it can be very scary. And I've had friends, unfortunately, who kind of took that to heart and was really excessively exercising or eating. And I kind of wish we would have said, hey, why don't you talk to someone about it? Kind of break through that habit because it is really scary, definitely for them going away and kind of being in charge on their own. And sometimes they just need that little extra support to understand if it is kind of developing into an eating disorder or how do they shift those feelings about it? Yeah. And I think it's really important to kind of, as Bren is emphasizing, to kind of catch things early on because then you can, um, you know, have a bigger impact and, you know, before they kind of turn into a full syndrome problem. Mm -hmm. And Anise, again, a great recommendation. You're on point with these recommendations today. Um, talking about the 2021 documentary, um, I Am Gen Z, and it really does focus on that teen girls in the TikTok perception with the mental and physical health intersex with the social media. Definitely, fortunately for my own personal TikTok has been staying away from it and more on the cosplaying side. So everybody's already mm -hmm. looking different. Um, but it is really kind of becoming a major presence. A lot of our children are talking about being on these social media platforms. So it is a great resource to kind of pull through and think about maybe like and you said, watch it first to make sure it's not going to be too upsetting for your friends or your little ones, but definitely informative. Thank you. So I think we should wrap it up. Thank you all for your questions and your interest. And um, it's been great hearing from you all. And if please feel free to reach out um, to Sasco River Center. If you have any more questions or concerns, we're here to help you um, with your children. Yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. All righty. Thanks. Bye.